Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, B2B Precision Play, Crafting an Effective ABM Strategy. My name is Arda. I'm part of the marketing team here at Stack Adapt. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Ryan and Reina to get us started. Hey, everyone. So just going to start off by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Reina. I'm one of the sales directors here at Stack Adapt. Um, I started back in 2020 and kind of had a focus on opening up our presence in the UK market. Um, I am half French, so as of 2024, I am just focusing on our presence in the French market. So if there's anyone who's you know bilingual or wants to ask about the French market specifically on the webinar, don't hesitate to ask. In my previous role before Stack Adapt, I was at another DSP um, that specialized in contextual B2B campaigns. So hopefully can provide some good context from a vendor side, B2B specific perspective. Over to you, Ryan. Great, thanks, Rainer. My name is Ryan, similar to Rainer, I am a sales director in the EMEA team. I've been at Stack It Up just over two and a half years and was fortunate enough to move into a sales director role at the start of the year. Um, unlike Rain, I can't brag about speaking another language. Um, it is just fluent English. I do apologize for anyone else that wants some more exciting insights from myself. Um, but I've worked across the whole industry in terms of the ecosystem, whether it's been publisher side, DSP, verification, um, and now today I landed at Stack It Up for the last two and a half years. Um, but yeah, very excited to take you guys through today. I'm sure Rainer as well, and we'll get going. So just to give you a bit of background about Stack Adapt for the guys that aren't familiar with us as a DSP. Founded in 2013 by three co-founders, um, Yang, Vitali, and Ilda. They were working um, a mixture of agency size, so Mindshares, Axis, actually Bloomberg, and Publisher. And they were using a DSP at the time. It wasn't great back then, because it's obviously advanced a lot now and evolved in many, many different ways. But wasn't great for targeting, reporting, service, creative, you name it. And because they had that rich client side experience, they thought, you know what? There's a massive gap in the market here for us to launch a DSP. And because we've got that rich client side experience, it's going to put us in good stead. So, you know, guess what? That's exactly what they did. Launched in Toronto, Canada. Fast forward to where we are now in 2024. To give an idea of the scope of how StackApp's grown, in the last three years, we had roughly 200 employees globally. Now we probably sit over, roughly speaking, 1,300. And we have offices not only just based in EMEA, which our headquarters is London, but we also have uh, Toronto, US, Singapore, and Australia. So it promises to be a very exciting year ahead for StackApp. And hopefully, B2B, you will find today, will be an exciting part of how we can help you guys as well on the call today. Talking about agenda, funny story with an agenda. We had Stackfest reach, uh, recently, which is our first ever company event where we flew everyone in to Toronto to have many different things going on in a good way in terms of speeches, simulations, and so forth. And one speaker actually said he hates an agenda and he wouldn't have it in there. Um, lo and behold, we have an agenda. So clearly haven't heeded that advice just yet, but it's definitely an action point for myself going forward for the rest of the year. Um, so this is what we plan um, and talking through today. Stack it up just to let you know by hook or by crook, we've actually become a B2B expert. Um, in all honesty, there's not too many DSPs in market can rival our capabilities. So hopefully as we go through today, we can just give you some food for thought, food for thought in general about the industry, upcoming topics and what you should be keeping out for, an eye out for from an agency perspective and a marketer. Um, but it promises to be very fruitful. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Rena and we can get kickstarted in the content. Amazing. Thanks so much, Ryan. Um, so as you can tell by the title on this slide, just going to kick things off by just setting the scene a little bit. Um, we're going to just talk about some major trends and themes that we're hearing about um, in the marketing space generally, but um, especially in the B2B marketing space. So First and foremost, um, a topic at the forefront of everyone's minds at the moment is generative AI um, or gen AI, as I'm gonna refer to it throughout the rest of this webinar, um, and how this is specifically reshaping what we do as marketers. So um, it's especially and fundamentally going to alter pretty much everything we do as marketers um, from content creation to personalization, to design innovations, to improving teams efficiency and productivity right it's going to hopefully help improve and take away a lot of our tedious you know manual tasks that we hate doing every day and allow us to spend more time 
thinking about strategy and creative and some of the more you know exciting things that we do in our role um, and of course it's definitely going to be used to figure out ways to improve ROI while we're all here at the end of the day um, with the growth of gen AI within businesses it is really really important to be proactive um, when mitigating against the negative impact of gen AI gen AI sorry um, I was actually just reading a stat by Insider Intel Intelligence the other day, um, and it said that over 61%, so more than half of organizations in the B2B space, say that they're lacking very clear guidelines for Gen AI. And this covers everything from how to vet AI content, um, safeguarding against privacy breaches for customer data, that's a really big one, um, especially in EMEA. And importantly, how Gen AI is actually representing the brand. So really, really important to start thinking about these things if you already are you know, looking at some Gen AI tools and how it can help um, your workflows. Um, so the more integrated this becomes into your workflows, the more, the more important it's gonna be to have really clear guidelines and governance um, across your business. Speaking of data, um, especially with the increased use of Gen AI, with heightened privacy concerns, all the data regulations we have going on in our markets. Um, it's at the center of everything we do, you know, despite cookie Armageddon that we keep hearing about, we still use data at the center of everything we do. So again, really, really important that you're vetting your data quality, um, the governance and how it's being used, especially when it comes to like predictive analytics, data integrations um, and hyper, hyper personalization, especially. Um, having said all that, um, now I just talked about tech and data. Um, at the end of the day, um, especially with B2B audiences, it's really important to remember that these audiences are still people. Um, they very much seek human connections. Personalization is still very much something that is sought out after when it comes to all those marketing experiences. So really important to remember to continue adding those kind of human elements um, storytelling, how can you appeal to their emotional side, right? Even in the B2B world, everyone has their own motivations, their own specific challenges that they're coming up against every single day. So it's really important to think about, um, you know, the things that our B2B audiences really, really care about. From a more strategic perspective, um, when we're talking about trends and themes, um, so I'm not gonna dig into all four of these. Um, I am gonna hone in all the way at the bottom of the slide here, um, the trends that we're seeing from a strategy perspective. So um, this one is obvious, that's why we're all here today. We're here to talk about ABM, um, but this is one of the trends that is seeing some of the highest growth. Um, and again, we'll delve into benefits a little later on in the, in the webinar. So hopefully you'll understand why we're seeing such a big increase. Um, but between 2022 and 2023, we saw an increase of 44.4%, a very specific number, um, in the usage of either account-based marketing, ABM, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as ABX, which is um, ABX, account-based experiences. Um, so these are all, um, have increased over the last couple of years, and we're definitely expecting to see the usage of ABM um, continue in B2B marketing campaigns. Um, now I'll pass over to Ryan, now that we've delved into some of the themes and trends, and he can dive into that B2B profile in a bit more detail. Perfect, thank you, Reina. So to start off with, there is a lot of stats on this slide in a good way. Um, so I'm just gonna talk you through each one of them and some key takeaways, really. If you're gonna take one thing from this webinar um, in particular, the thing that I would take is there is a lot of multiple stakeholders that you need to be advertising to in order to get your product over line with who you're trying to in attract essentially. As you see here on the left hand side, it takes on average about six to 10 decision makers. So don't just think you're going after that one person that holds all the power, holds the strings and the one signs off, that may well be the case they sign off, but there is different departments before that and different colleagues and so forth that would have probably have done their research and had a look as well. Um, also, the other key things to take away here, as you see here, is the demographics. So yes, a big portion of it is that 41 to 55 age demographic, but if you look at the others all the way, well, from 18 to 25, all the way to 56 plus, 
you have to bear in mind that yes, that is a key audience, but you have to tie these other demographics, these other seniorities and other departments, because they are all playing their part in the bigger picture. And that's kind of a, a great way to look at it. And when you're thinking about targeting all these different multiple stakeholders, as you can see in the pie chart above, one thing to bear in mind, and we all know this when we go into an office, that anything of information that you know takes piece, uh, a person's interest or they find exciting, that messaging is gonna spread like wildfire in the office. So think of it as this logic. If you're advertising a particular colleague or colleagues, then the chances are they're gonna speak in the next meeting over lunch in their next one-to-one. -one, and then suddenly it goes from a lower stakeholder, the lowest part of the food chain, so to speak, right up the way to decision maker in a matter of days and weeks. So do bear that in mind. Like I said, I can take one message away, that B2B process and, and in the marketing specifically, it's a lot of stakeholders involved. Coming on to the next one with the B2B buying process, it's actually a few questions to ask yourself. Um, what are you doing for these brands to approach you? Because as you can see at the top of the screen, 83% of buyers initiate the first contact. And I suppose the second question too is, what are you doing to stand out from the crowd? So of course, with your messaging, your creatives, you know, your brand guidelines, whatever it may be, one, it has to be cohesive across the whole chain because what the stats on the left are telling us is B2B decision makers do a lot of thorough research. So in actual essence, you need to make sure that regardless of what platform you're speaking to, regardless of what stakeholder you're speaking to, that your messaging is cohesive all the way through, so it's telling a story. But how are you standing out from the crowd? So have a look and fine tune and be very granular of how you're trying to appeal to tight audience because 83% of these buyers are gonna to come to you. And the reason they're gonna to come to you is because they've maybe seen something new or they motively, you they kind of um, appeal to your brand story that you're trying to tell and they, they want to reach out. So, so bear in this mind, how can you be proactive as opposed to reactive when it comes to the market? So it's a really, really key point. And the other thing this is also telling us is with that cohesive messaging, just think about you know more than just a couple of things, but your website, your blogs, articles, posts, webinars, reviews, all the way through that process, just make sure it's very cohesive and it's very aligned because there's many parts to it, not only just the multiple stakeholders, but you just got to make sure it's very cohesive. And when it comes to influence decisions, there's a lot of stats here, again, in a great way um, to kind of delve deeper into it. And I'm sure you guys are reading down the list as we speak, but a few key takeaways, and I'm going to sound like a broken record of apologies over the next few slides, but it's important we get this message across. So again, what is this telling us? There's more touch points than you think when a B2B marker's thinking about you know, making that right decision. So as you can see at the very top, virtual means of vendors, and it all goes all the way down the list. Um, one thing this is also highlighting to me is they do a lot of thorough research. So with this decision in general for B2B markers, they're not just you know, off the cuff gonna say, oh, I saw a great ad the other day, and then they go research and off the go, it's a converge point. There's a lot of thorough research that goes into this, whether it's talking internally uh, with, with, with peers, whether it's looking at different webinars, whether it's going to events, looking at different training material, a lot of thorough research goes into it. So just something to bear in mind. And obviously you can dig deeper into these points in general as well. Um, one thing at the top that strikes me with this one as well, which I thought was quite interesting, and I know this is very hot topic with any campaign you run, so I do apologize, but view through conversions, because what we're saying here is that 14% see, but don't click on the vendor ad. So if we're being a little bit ignorant and just actually and looking at click conversions specifically, we're, look, we're missing a large part of the measurement puzzle. Because if you think about this logic, I'm a B2B marker, I see an ad for that particular brand, I then go away, do my research, chat internally and so forth, and then that process takes a few weeks, if not months. My last stage of the process typically is gonna search online for that brand, click on that PPC link or the organic link and convert. And with that being said, that won't get attributed as a click conversion, but a view through conversion. So please make sure that when you are running measurement, especially B2B clients, that you're looking at both view through conversion and click conversion as well. One thing that stands out for me as well, um, as you can see here, very high stat, 42% attend a vendor sponsored event, e.g. a dinner. So yes, this is budget dependent, but think about that as a logic as well. If you can have an event where people physically come and see you, Yes, you can tell your brand story, but obviously there's something a little bit different about when you meet someone in person as you do maybe virtually. So having an event where you can really go to town showcasing your brand, your messaging, and trying to attract you know your perfect customer, 
that is something that's jumping out of the screen that 42% consider is a big thing for them that's going to essentially affect their purchase decisions. So something to bear in mind. And what is particularly interesting about this list, and it's something else to consider from an account management perspective um, and even optimization, but look at these all conversion points. So for example, some I wrote down earlier is, you know, webinar conversion point, filling in a form conversion point, someone going on a website and clicking a button on the CTA is a conversion point. So when you are setting up your campaigns, think of these of all different conversion points and you can weight them accordingly. And then coming outside of the conversion points, think of it as an optimization exercise. So you could take the stats you see here and then weight it accordingly. So maybe what you say here is when someone, you know, fills in a lead or fills in a form, then that gets a certain weight in. If someone clicks a button and then goes to webinar, that gets a certain weight in. So not only can you use these stats for conversion points, but you can also use them for actual optimizations in general. So thinking a little bit outside the box, I think these stats in general can really make sure your campaigns run as efficiently as you possibly can. And then last slide for me on this particular topic, We'll talk about the top stats again with performance guaranteed offer during sale. So there's a big if here. If you can offer some sort of performance guarantee, that is imperative for a lot of these buyers when making decision, but it is an if because there's not a lot of things you can put a hunting guarantee on. But what this is also telling us, at least 72% of people in general would consider all five things when making a decision. So whether that's product availability, ability to purchase, customer service, and experience across all channels. So something else um, to bear in mind as well. And also the other thing to think about is when you're thinking about these different stakeholders, and there'll be a lot of them in the buying process, some of them will find some of these points more interesting than others, so they'll have different priorities. So don't necessarily prioritize just number one, but again, look at all five different uh, key touch points there. And lastly, and I kind of mentioned this as well, but what this is telling us, again, it comes down to multiple different touch points. So cohesive messaging, cohesive targeting, and just appealing to every single stakeholder in the journey and just making sure it's a very rounded picture and story trying to tell as honing in and just kind of um, segmenting itself off to one or two things. I will now pass you back to Raina. Um, thank you so much, Ryan. Um, so obviously we've talked a little bit more about kind of the general B2B themes, um, B2B buyer profiles, things like that. We're going to delve into for the next two sections. We're really going to delve into um, ABM, what it is, definition, and how to kind of really get started with um, thinking about your ABM strategies. So, first and foremost, what is account based marketing? Um, it's very simple it's a go to market strategy that targets certain accounts with a synchronized and continuous set of marketing and sales activities to engage those accounts through every single stage of that buyer journey. So from that very first you know, awareness touch point all the way down to that lower funnel conversion, all the way through to retaining those customers once you have made that sale um, with very specific accounts, i.e. businesses. So to put it a little more simply, it's essentially just a strategy that targets employees of very, very specific companies that you and your business wanna go after rather than individual consumers. When thinking of ABM, there's really kind of three key principles that you wanna be thinking about when coming up with your strategy. Um, the first one, as mentioned, it's both taken on by marketing and sales. So you really wanna make sure that your marketing and sales teams are aligned, um, right? Marketing needs to know what account sales are going after, sales needs to know what content and offers um, and all the other fun stuff that the marketing team are putting together for those accounts specifically. Otherwise, it will just be a big old mess and unorganized. The other key principle, this one's a little bit more obvious. Um, it's an account-centric strategy. Um, so again, you're focusing all your efforts on some very specific key accounts for the business. Um, and your go-to-market plan. You really, really want to make sure that um, both sales and marketing, but the entire business really, is aware of what that go-to-market plan is from, again, the pre-sale experience all the way through to you've gained that account as a new customer. What is that post-sale onboarding experience going to be like? How are you going to retain that client? Um, and really being aware of that go-to-market go -to plan is a key principle for, for ABM. 
Moving on to the next slide. Now, um, lots of information on this slide. I'm not gonna go through every single element. Otherwise, I would probably take up the whole hour, um, if not more, really dissecting each aspect. Um, I'm gonna call out three specifically, um, which is data, technology, and target accounts. So for target accounts, um, again, we'll delve into that a bit more specifically in the next few slides. Um, but you really want to work out what your ICP is, your ideal customer profile, and that will then kind of fit into the target accounts aspect of this strategy. Data, um, I keep talking about it, really, really important, especially in this day and age with all the regulations and everything like that, that you're very aware of your data quality, um, what databases you're using, what your data management process is like, um, what type of data you're using. So this is an EMEA focused webinar. I think we're all very aware of the challenges that come with you know, cookie based solutions in the ABM space. So perhaps you wanna look at different types of you know, data identifiers like IP addresses for, for companies, um, maybe device IDs, right? If you're running some mobile campaigns, um, but really important that you have a good understanding of what that looks like within your business. Um, and technology. Um, again, I wouldn't be coming here from a DSP perspective if I wasn't going to talk a little bit more about the tech stack. Um, so again, really important to know how the tech that you're using to power your ABM campaigns um, works, what the limitations are, what, the, what, what capabilities it does have, um, and how it marries up with the data that you're using. You know, can you track properly with that platform that you're using? Um, so a lot of questions to ask. Um, these are definitely questions you can ask your vendors, your data providers, all these things, you're not alone, um, but these are really important to nail down um, before you get into your ABM strategy. Um, of course, oh, sorry, back to the next slide. I was just gonna do a little shameless plug. <laughs> Obviously, there's a lot of information on this slide. Um, so if you do need some support um, for any clients on the call, obviously you can reach out to myself or Ryan or your Stack Adapt rep um, if you really want to dig into those elements that I haven't necessarily dove into. Um, sorry, Ryan, now we can go to the next slide. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, right, so we mentioned, obviously there's a massive growth um, in ABM. Um, why are we seeing this growth? It's very, very simple. Um, we're seeing a growth in ABM because it's a strategy that works, just to put it simply. Um, these are strategies that are driving, you know, very substantial uh, business impact for those who are using these strategies. Um, when executed well, benefits, again, very simple, what we all strive towards for marketers, um, but stronger relationships between your sales teams and your clients, um, right? You're gaining a lot of insights at an account level that can really empower your sales teams to better service those accounts, um, and also just from a pre-sale perspective, understand what it is that they actually need, what the challenges are that they're kind of uh, coming up against. Um, and same for your marketing teams. All of these insights that we're gaining can really help them, um, you know, uh, fill in their next kind of marketing campaign with what's being engaged with, what's resonating. Um, so lots of valuable insights there. Obviously improved ROI um, when we are executing an ABM strategy um, well, you should hopefully start to see much more ROI coming from those campaigns compared to your other campaigns. And um, at the end of the day, the end all and be all is more conversions, i.e. more revenue for your business. Um, so lots of different benefits that you can gain from a well executed ABM strategy. Um, and lastly, for this section, so again, talks about the benefits of ABM, um, but what are the actual factors that can lead to a well-executed ABM campaign? Or on the flip side, what might actually impact you negatively that might stop you from seeing those be benefits? So I'm actually going to start with the hurdles here, um, not to be a little negative Nelly, but... Um, and I'm not gonna dive into all of these either. I'm just gonna focus on those two top ones because those are the ones that have the most impact. So um, what might impact your ABM success? This is a big one, your budget. Um, if you have a massive, massive list of target accounts and you're going across all of the different markets with a very limited budget, 
you're just really risking um, not being able to kind of cut through the noise and making a real impact with those target accounts. So if you do have a limited budget, not to say that you will fail uh, and you can't do ABM, but you just want to be much more strategic with it. So maybe you want to start off with a smaller list. Maybe you want to cut down the number of markets that you're actually running in. Um, you really want to make sure that the budget you are using is going to allow you to, again, get that engagement from those accounts, cut through the noise, um, and get enough data that you can make you know, statistically accurate optimizations and decisions for your campaigns. Um, another one that we sometimes come across, and this one actually always makes me laugh a little bit because it's not the worst problem to have in the world, but um, we'll sometimes hear if someone's kind of gone uh, to an ABM strategy really, really quickly. They actually haven't realized um, that they might lack some of the internal resources that they need. So they've launched an ABM campaign. It's gone really, really well in that they're getting loads of inbound requests. They're getting lots of new leads. Um, but the sales team actually just doesn't have the capacity to deal with the number of leads they're getting. So again, just something to think about. Take your time, figure out internally what you can handle in terms of bandwidth um, and make sure that you kind of um, are aware of, of those limitations as well. Um, on the flip side, for successful ABM campaigns, um, some of the key factors that come into this is uh, the number one is actually the technology you use. Um, so again, question your vendors on their limitations. What can they do? What can't they do? What data are they using? What type of data is it? Can you track all that data? I could go on and on, um, but really vet the technology that you're using. And as long as you know, you've kind of vetted it properly, this should hopefully lead to your successful ABM campaigns. Um, Finally, sorry, and I'm talking a lot here. Um, ABM can be a really powerful strategy to utilize for, for B2B um, customer marketers, sorry. But um, as I mentioned right before, you really want to set yourself up and not rush into these types of campaigns. Um, again, you can reach out to your stack at reps or your vendors that you're working with to really work closely with them before you launch these strategies to make sure that it's a smooth, organized, and cohesive process between the sales and the marketing team. Okay, take a quick breath here. Um, I've been talking a lot, so hopefully you're all still with me. Um, we've covered a lot of the principles of ABM. Um, so now I wanna delve into a little bit more practical information, like how do you actually get started with um, figuring out your list of target accounts and all the other different things you wanna start thinking about. So um, if you can hop to the next slide, please, perfect. This is a really nice visual of what I'm about to talk through. So the first thing you want to do, um, and hopefully again as a business, you already have a pretty good understanding of what your TAM is, your total addressable market. If you do not, this is a very simple way that you can kind of start working through this. So you're going to start off with the global purchasing power for your services or your products that you're selling at a global scale. You know, what would actually be achievable if you know all your ideal customers were purchasing your products from your business. Um, once you have that kind of global purchasing power, what's the actual purchasing power for the markets that you operate in, right? There might be some markets you can't operate in or um, you haven't started yet. Um, so that's what we'll call the actual total available market. And of that TAM, how much of it is already in your database, right? Maybe some of them are already clients. Maybe the majority of them are still prospects, but you probably have data on existing prospects and clients. Um, so once you are aware of what's in your database, that's when you can really come up with some, you know, incremental, maybe low hanging fruit targets, moderate and then aggressive growth targets. So what can I go after now in the short term that I will actually be able to close? And then if we're being really, really aggressive and really um, ambitious, what are those aggressive growth targets to add as many of our ideal client profiles into our database? Now you have an idea of your TAM and your growth targets. Um, how can you actually formalize your account selection? Um, and what specific parameters are you going to think about to come up with your target account list? Um, that will be on the next slide, please. Um, so very well and dandy to have a, an idea of what your TAM is. Now you really want an actual, OK, what, what companies can we go after? 
Um, maybe you're still struggling to figure out what companies are, you know, in your TAM or which ones you want to focus on. Um, what you can look at within your database is these different types of parameters and ways to think about your uh, clients. So have a look at your data, see if there's any kind of common themes within the firmographics of your existing clients, right? Maybe a lot of them are in a similar industry, um, or maybe you want to go after an industry that you don't already have. Maybe a lot of your clients are in businesses with a certain number of employees. So maybe the larger businesses in the world versus the smaller ones. Um, maybe all your customers have a very similar annual revenue number. That's what we talk about when we're talking about firmer graphics. Um, persona, so there's kind of two ways to think about persona, right? There's, uh, we get a lot of people who wanna go after very specific decision makers, right? That's a kind of a, a persona or a buyer profile. Um, that's obviously a little bit more limited um, depending on the market that you're in. So again, it's much more difficult in EMEA to do kind of ABM plus very, very specific B2B buyer personas. Um, but if you can't target the actual individual, you can still think about the persona when you're looking at that database, right? What are the motivations of the teams that actually buy your services or products? What's the value that you can offer to them? Um, et cetera, what might make them essentially want to engage with you. Um, and then another one we don't always talk about a lot, um, but I actually find quite interesting is technographics. So what softwares and technologies are your customers using? Um, are they using you guys? Are they using competitive technology? Or maybe there's a technology that works in tandem with the service that you're providing. Um, so maybe seeing if there's some common commonalities with the technographic aspects of your customer basis or your ideal customer profile. So thinking about your TL, your target account list um, through these parameters is really going to help you formalize um, essentially your business's ideal customer profile and come up with that um, ABM list of accounts. Um, great. So you've got your target list of accounts. You started running your campaigns um, or ready to start those campaigns. What are some other things that you need to think about? Um, ABM is really all about capturing the attention um, and convincing your target accounts that you're, you know, the right solution for them. So personalization is a really powerful way to transit that mess, tra uh, transmit that message. Um, and there's a couple different ways that you can do that. So um, on the slide here, we've got, you know, the landing page. Maybe you can put some very specific information about those industries or those buying teams that might be arriving on your landing page. Um, maybe you can do some dynamic content um, within your creative based on, you know, perhaps they've engaged with you already and you can dynamically reserve them content that's relevant to their previous visits. Um, just loads of different ways you can personalize and the more creative you can get, um, the more you'll stand out from what your competitors are doing really. And finally, um, I'm coming up to my last slide before I hand over to Ryan here. I thank everybody for following along so far, but measuring ABM success. Um, how do you actually measure and track the success of your ABM campaigns? Very similar to how you track success for you know b2c campaigns as well um but these are kind of some of the main ways to look at this so engagement right which accounts are seeing your impressions which accounts are clicking through to your impressions which accounts are staying on your landing page for longer signing up to webinars you know the more engagement you can see out of specific accounts the better your abm strategies are going pipeline orchestration again this is a big one for sales teams are these target accounts moving through your pipeline from that initial discovery call all the way to, you know, sales one, closing that account. Um, and again, I've repeated this before, conversions and ROI from a marketing perspective, the more accounts that are driving conversions and improving that ROI, the better your ABM strategy is. Um, and so these are all things to kind of look out for um, to track the success of ABM. Back over to you, Ryan, that was a lot. Um, so hopefully a um, little change of voice will do everyone some good on the webinar. <laughs> I loved it, Raina. So yeah, all good um, and thanks, thanks for that as well. 
So I know what you guys are thinking, Ryan, Rainer, you gave us some great content about the B2B market landscape, what we should be looking out for, and hopefully you found it useful. But what would a webinar be without a shameless plug of Stackalat's products? So here we go. Um, so I'm only doing this for, for you guys on the webinar because I know you've been requesting it. So with Stackalat, like I said, we've kind of, by hook of our we've fallen into being kind of B2B experts. Obviously, we have amazing capabilities across most uh, verticals that customers run with us, but B2B especially one that we've honed in on the last couple of years to expand out a little bit further. We work with some amazing providers, as you see there, Lead Forensics, Bombora, HG uh, Insights, IOTA. And what that essentially means is outside of just ABM targeting, which is just one um, branch of what we can do, we can also target by thermographics. So if you guys want to target by industry, job function, seniority, company size, company revenue, we can do that. We can also target by company search, which essentially is like an intent browsing audience, but for B2B. Um, and Rainer kind of mentioned it as well with technographics, but we can actually um, harness up capabilities to target people based on the technology they're using. So for example, if you wanted to target customers that you um, know, use Microsoft Azure, we can do that, create a segment, and you can target them around the programmatic ecosystem. With ABM targeting specifically, because that has been a key theme of what we've been speaking through today, at the back end of last year, we've integrated with a partner called Lead Forensics, also you might have heard of them, um, I think they merged with IP Flow. So it's a great partnership for us. And what that means is on a self-serve um, basis, you can log into the platform and you can actually create your own, own ABM list there and then the platform to then pop, populate within 24 hours. And then further to that, you can then measure later on. The great thing as well to mention about Lee Forensics as well, because it's all done on an IP level, this is gonna be absolutely music to ears talking about cookie deprecation. So something to bear in mind as well. Um, but with Lead Forensics, like I say, it's an amazing tool. You can go into the platform, you can run it yourself, and it's just the fact you can see your ABM list populate within the you know, next 24 hours, it's gonna be a bit of a game changer when you're running ABM lists. And then lastly, you know, this is relevant. I know it says US and you're probably thinking, you know, this is a MIA webinar, that is correct. But we have a lot of customers across the board that yes, they do run in MIA, but they also have um, a lot of customers that they wanna run in the US as an example. So I think it's important to mention this, that we actually have our own physical B2B tool in the US. Um, so if you ever wanted to take advantage of that, then please reach out to your relevant sales manager, account manager, and we can talk you through how that would work. But essentially, where it is our own B2B tool, it means you get that little bit closer to targeting and a little bit more further insight when it comes to the measurement and reporting piece as well. Um, so by all means, we can obviously help in a general term across the globe, but US specifically, uh, specifically, shall I say, if you need any help with ABM targeting and B2B audiences, then please let us know. Cool. We're going to wrap this up with a few key takeaways and a Q&A. Uh, &A. So for the last part, I'm going to hand back to Rainer. I promise I will keep this one short this time. Um, but just to kind of recap what we've talked about, and if if there's really anything we want you leaving these, this webinar with, it's it's these points. So. ABM is absolutely going to start uh, keep growing in B2B. Um, if you or your clients haven't started, um, it's a great time to start thinking about it. Um, it's really going to help drive success for any kind of B2B marketers. Um, very, very key to develop a framework and measure success. Know how you're kind of tracking the results. What are you going to actually look like? Look at for the metrics, right? Is it more of an awareness play for those target accounts to start, or are these pretty warm accounts and you want to focus on, you know, getting that conversion and closing those accounts? Um, but absolutely, making sure there's alignment between the sales and marketing team, very, very important. Um, and then, of course, utilize purpose-built ABM tools. Um, there are Stack Adapt is one of them, but there are other technologies out there um, that are built specifically to, a, to run powerful ABM campaigns. So do your research, question your vendors. You know, if you guys have any questions for us, I could talk about ABM for hours. Um, and yeah, have fun. It's a really fun space to be in. Um, and hopefully you guys will enjoy putting together your very first ABM strategies or continuing to build on top of them. Thank you, Reina and Ryan. I can take over from here. Uh, thank you both. And uh, we would now like to jump into the Q&A portion of the webinar and open up the floor to any questions. 
as a reminder, if you have any questions, please place them in the questions box of the GoToWebinar panel. There are already several questions coming through, so just a heads up, if you're not able to get to your question today, please don't worry, we will follow up directly with you after the webinar. Okay, so the first question is, do you have a suggested minimum budget to get good performance in an ABM campaign? It's a good question. Um, I can take this one, Ryan, unless you want to hop in. Um, and I apologize, this might be a slightly disappointing answer, but I would say it depends. Um, I think I can see that Ellie asked this question. Um, so I would definitely suggest chatting to Ryan um, about a very specific case, but it absolutely depends. It depends on what those objectives are, right? Are you going to be running an awareness campaign? How many accounts are on that list? What markets you're running in? Um, obviously, you probably need to be at least at the, you know, 10 to 20K mark, you know, at a very bare minimum, but it really, really depends on, you know, what kind of markets you're going after, the objectives you want to go after how many accounts you're going after, you know, how large those accounts are going after. Um, so again, definitely something that your Stack It Up Direct could help you with, um, but a hard question to answer when we don't have many other details about these specific objectives. Thank you, Reyna. Um, a second question that we have is, in terms of resource allocation, how do you recommend balancing efforts between broad demand generation activities and targeted ABM initiatives? Yeah, I don't um, mind. I'm hop in. Oh, sorry, Actually, go ahead, no, Brian. I'll let you no, take no, it. You go, for it. Go, on, go for it, go on. Um, well, you might have a different response to me, so please do feel free to hop in. Again, I was going to say it depends. Um, you know, are you running this ABM strategy to build awareness with this target um, list of target accounts, right? Have they never heard of you? Do you already have some engagement with you? So if this is more of like an awareness play, you obviously want to put more budget around those upper funnel channels that you'll be running. Um, if these are really, really warm leads or maybe even retention accounts with existing customers, you maybe want to put um, a little bit more budget during, towards those lower funnel um, channels or anything that's kind of um, really pushing lead gen like webinar signups or attending a specific event that you want that you'll be running. Um, so it depends. Um, but again, reach out if you have a very specific use case um, and we can chat through that and um, hopefully can help. But again, Ryan, if you had a specific answer there, feel free to hop in because I'm sure they're sick of me saying it depends. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you covered it. The only thing I was going to say is a million dollar question. Um, I would also say it relates back to the brand and the, how many people actually know of the brand in the market. And if it's very much up a funnel, then that would inform how much budget you should be putting in more of an awareness piece ABM. And if a lot of people are already familiar with the brand, then maybe the kind of ratio goes more towards the performance lower end of the funnel. So yeah, totally agree with Ren's points, just to add on one other thing as well. Thank you both. Um, another question that we have is, which channels have you found to be most effective for ABM campaigns? Yes, great question. Um, and in all honesty, and here's something to think about, because B2B, reach wise and availability um, of impressions online is a, you know going to be less a consumer for obvious reasons the channels that historically we find work best are display native video um for many reasons really but then free channels because they've been a, around a long time in programmatic they very much matured as channels um and also they tend to have the biggest reach out of the seven channels we have available on our platform so that's number one um, display native, it goes without saying, display is like a very universal, universal ad I'd suggest for most things. Native particularly is great for B2B because you've got the headline, the commentary. So if you want to have a headline about the brand and the commentary starts to talk about the product or webinar, then I think native is amazing for that. And it's also perfect for engagement. And then video, without teaching everyone to suck eggs in this call, but when it comes to storytelling and you want to showcase your product, um, then video is going to be amazing for that alongside the reach aspect as well. So. Uh, display Nathan video would be the free I'd recommend. Thank you, Ryan. Um, another question is, what considerations should we take into account when designing landing pages specifically for ABM audiences? Yeah, that's a good one. I'll hop in with this one. Mm -hmm. So um, again, this will kind of depend in the, on the markets that you're working in, right? If you're running an ABM campaign in the US, you can probably do a much more granular approach to being able to personalize those those landing pages 
Um, just focusing on Amio, right, where it tends to be more limited at the account level. So um, I think just any way you can kind of personalize the content of that landing page to, again, either that buying team or the industry that they're in or the kind of pain points that they might be experiencing. Um, another thing to really consider, especially, you know, kind of depending where these accounts are, you know, within the pipeline, if it's a pre-sale account, is especially if you're asking them to sign up to something, download a white paper, um, you know, buy a ticket to an event, is to make sure that they're also gaining some values from that page. So we do tend to see a lot of lead gen campaigns that will just send users straight to a form fill page, which can work if, you know, those people are aware of your brand, know the product, and that was what their intention was in landing on that page. But if it's something completely new, just try and give them as much information as you can before you're asking them to kind of make that conversion or, you know, share their data with you. Um, there's a lot of stats out there um, that say customers are very willing to part with their data as long as they're getting something back. So just think about the value that you're offering that person as they're landing on the landing page. I think that's a pretty generic piece of advice, not just for ABM, um, but there are ways to think about that in an ABM specific way as well. So hopefully that answers that question. Thank you, Reina. And uh, another question is, do you have experience in B2B, in creating B2B creatives? Yes, and what a question that is. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, Stack Adapt, if you guys aren't familiar, we actually have our own Create Studio. Um, and just to give you a bit more weight to this, the Create Studio is about 70 plus people globally. Um, and as a company, we heavily invest in this department in general. So yes, if you guys ever need any help, um, and it's worth mentioning, this isn't just display, it's display native video, audio, TV, in-game, digital at home. Then you have a designated um, designer or strategist that can work with you, whether it's an email, call, and we can create these assets for you. Um, and one thing I would say, the Create Studio, I'm probably their biggest fan in a honesty, but in the two and a half years I've been here, with all my customers that have tested Create Studio against either their own assets, whether that's the agency brand or these are creative agency, we've always outperformed um, their own assets. And the main reason for that is, in the one is because these guys are just designing programmatic ads all the time. So the way they're laid out, you know, the way they're meant to be engaged with the CTAs and they constantly just evolve in the way they design these ads. Um, they're just very much experts in that field. So something to bear in mind, yes, we can do it. In a lot of cases, it works out free, but feel free to reach out to your relevant SM and AM and, and we can talk you through that. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so another question is, any recommendations for campaign duration for ABM? Um, I'll take this one. Again, a very good question. Um, I'm not going to say it depends because I think everyone's going to want to kick me out otherwise. But look, ideally, um, ABM strategies are something that are more of a always on approach. And by that, I mean, hopefully there's always an ABM strategy at play. Um, I think they would all kind of last different lengths. So again, um, you know, if you're starting off pretty new and you're trying to build awareness for accounts, right? You might need a little bit more time to kind of get data, see what's resonating, what messaging you need to run. So you probably want to have, you know, maybe some longer campaigns uh, when it comes to AVM if it's, you know, first touch awareness. If it's engagement, maybe lower down the funnel. Um, and you kind of see these accounts moving through the pipeline, especially, obviously those are going to be a little bit short, right? Because um, if you're running a, I don't know, awareness campaign followed by more of a lead gen campaign with specific accounts and you finally get that account over the line, you probably don't want to keep hitting them up with the same awareness ads, right? But you might want to shift to a um, customer retention campaign instead. So Ideally, I'm speaking from a vendor side here, ideally there's always an ABM campaign on for B2B marketers, um, but obviously that can kind of change depending on, you know, where you're at with that specific ABM list. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers as well, but again, difficult to give very concrete timelines because every business is different um, and working towards different goals. But hopefully that gave you a good idea of how to think about it. Thank you, Reina. That was very insightful. Another question we have about Lead Forensics is 
how do you match the company name, lead forensics only, or other integrations too? Yeah, it's a good question. And it kind of goes back to what I said earlier. So Lee Forensics, um, the way it works is based off an IP address. So that's the way they match that. Um, they would have their own bias graphs, if you like, internally with all these different IP addresses and based on people's behavior in the past, they'd be able to match them accordingly to the businesses. Um, so yeah, that's essentially how to do it. It's all through an IP address and that would be from you know years and years of data they collected to then have this very robust solution which allows for ABM targeting. Um, and then on a side note to that, when you're running your campaigns for ABM, from a measurement perspective, um, you can actually see by business who's interacting with you, um, which is great. So then you actually can start to understand, right, these sort of businesses, when you start to group them together, interacting with us, and then that's ultimately going to inform your marketing decisions going forward. So having that on the reporting side of things when it comes to ABM um, essentially reduces wastage going forward as well. Thank you, Ryan. And another question that we have is, can you run brand lift studies for B2B? Yes, absolutely. So I just saw both Ryan and I started nodding our heads. So mm -hmm. yes, you can run brand lift studies um, in any vertical, really. Um, you can definitely do it for B2B. Highly recommended if you're doing any awareness campaigns. Um, it's really easy to do. It's always worth doing a bit of a brand lift study. And I will also add, when running brand lift studies, most people want to see a positive uplift, right? Especially if the question is, have you heard of brand X and brand X happens to be your brand? If you're putting money behind awareness campaigns, you always want to see people answering, yes, I have heard of it. However, I do want to just say that even negative, um, negative brand lift studies, I guess, I'm actually not sure what the right term would be there. Um, but those can be really powerful for you as marketers, right? Again, it's not always the aim when you're running an awareness campaign, but that can really help inform your teams of, okay, what we're currently doing for awareness isn't working. We're not breaking through the noise. We're not, um, you know, of the people who we're targeting, we're clearly not staying in their brains. So what do we have to change to turn that negative brand list study into a positive uplift? Everyone has heard of your brand. so. Um, yes, we can do it and, um, you know, take the negative ones just as useful as the positive ones. Thank you. Um, last two questions. So is there options in Stack It Up to launch an ABM specific campaign? Uh, only new to using Stack It Up and I'm about to use it for a B2C clients. Can you say that question again, Arda, please, just so I can hear it again? Yeah, definitely. So the question is, is there options in Stack It Up to launch an ABM specific campaign? This is the question. And mm -hmm. someone mentioned that they're only new to using Stack It Up and they're about to use it for a B2C client. Oh, I see. So essentially, can you use it for other campaigns outside of ABM? Can you just use it for other B2C clients as well? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Oh, perfect. Yes, absolutely. So today's webinar, yes, we have um, honed in on just B2B, which is just one part of many arms that we have at Stack Adapt. But yeah, absolutely. So we have, you know, loads of other tools, um, if not more geared towards B2C. So if you guys are looking to run more of a consumer driven campaign, then absolutely. Um, like anything, reach out to your SM and AM and we can run through it. But rest assured, we have a lot, lot of capabilities there. And in actual fact, 2024, can't give it away just yet but there's a lot more exciting updates coming. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for that as well. Thank you. And our last question is, what does your ABM reporting look like? Um, I can hop in for this one. So it will depend. We have two tools um, to run ABM campaigns um, as Brian covered. Um, so one of them is just US specific and the other one is more for EMEA. Um, so from a reporting perspective, it will depend, my favorite answer, on the market that you're running in. If you're targeting the U.S., um, much to my sadness, you can get much more reporting than what you can get in EMEA, and that's just because of the data that's available out there. There's way less limitations when it comes to data and identifiers and things like that. Um, so if you're targeting the US with an ABM campaign, it's really cool. You can get account level reporting. Um, so you can see the actual companies that are engaging with your ads. 
and you can actually drill that down to further firmographic settings. So you could run an ABM list in the US and then add on, you know, you only want to target C-suite within those ABM lists. Um, I would highly recommend keeping it broader. Again, we've talked about how many different buyer profiles are involved. So maybe you want to add on a couple of different team functions. Um, and once you've ran that campaign, you'll be able to see any parameter that you've set at the targeting perspective. You can see um, at the reporting side of things. In EMEA, it's a little bit more limited and that's just because of data limitations we can report back at the account level um, for the moment. So again, targeting accounts, you can then get insights at that account level. Um, so hopefully that answers that question a bit long-winded. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much once again, Reina and Ryan. And that concludes today's webinar. Thank you all so much for attending today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone, have a nice day. Thanks, guys.